Have you always wondered where your produce came from, especially when you go to the supermarket, you want to know whether or not this is truly organic or was this handled appropriately before it came to the supermarket? Well, this particular project named Suku is a supply chain service on the blockchain or, and at the same time, I have the privilege of interviewing the CEO of Citizens Reserve, who is in charge of this project, and we're gonna find out more about the, um, the supply chain management blockchain uh, ecosystem and how is it going to revolutionize the way we are going to attain data and of course, to make sure that everything is supplied properly, properly and accounted for. Now, take note, Suku is not and will not be available to US persons. As such, the content and distribution of this interview are not intended for US persons. The IEO dates will be October 30th at 11 a.m. UTC to November the 7th on liquid.com. Now, without further ado, let me bring, uh, bring in um, Jonathan from Suku. Jonathan from Citizens Reserve. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Hi there, Jonathan. Just in time. So, Jonathan, uh, very quickly now, I think I'm very excited, especially all the viewers are going to be pretty interested to find out how Suku can actually help in determining um, where their produce is going to be from. I think we, especially the conscious consumers, right? Uh, these days, I mean, I was never a conscious consumer previously, okay? But ever, since I, I. <laughs> ever since I became a father, right, of two daughters, right, I obviously will be a little bit more concerned about where I get my chicken from, where I get my beef from, where, where my vegetables are from. So kind of give me a little bit of a, a, a background and why uh, of all projects within the blockchain space, how did you guys decide to narrow it down to uh, supply chain management on the blockchain or supply chain as a service on the blockchain? Sounds great. So back, back then when we were at Deloitte working for the blockchain lab in New York like uh, two years ago, so we've been there for four years uh, working with Fortune 500 companies, we um, realized that supply chain one of the, was one of the biggest opportunities in the space, was really a great match with, with blockchain. And we, we were seeing a lot of traction with clients. Um, so when we discover uh, this client that was actually designing a supply chain solution, a company called Citizen Reserve, the company that I'm a part of right now, we decided to jump um, and move to, to the startup to, to basically work on this concept that this ecosystem that aims to make supply chains more transparent and efficient. Initially for the B2B space, so suppliers, manufacturers, distributors. And then we, we spent a year and a half building that ecosystem that I can give you more details later. And then we said, okay, we need to translate those benefits to the end consumer, right? And when you think about the end consumer, who is our end consumer? Who is the one that is interested in getting the benefits that we built through the V2B. And for us, that was the conscious consumer. When we look at the numbers, we see that the sustainable uh, market for, for products is a $2.5 trillion market. The most important number, I can tell you, and this is the most important piece of what, of what we do and how validates the value that we wanna provide in this, in this market is when you look at this group of consumers that want to buy sustainably, but they don't do it today just because they don't trust the brands, they don't trust the labels. It's not only about food, it's about furniture, it's about any product where they don't trust the provenance, they don't trust the claims. So there's a big group of people that want to buy sustainably and they don't do it because they don't trust. And there's a huge lack of verification. And we understood that by using blockchain and by using the verification tool that we created, we can help bridge that gap. We can help connect the conscious consumer, which represents a $1 trillion opportunity. That's what I was telling you on these consumers don't trust. That's a $1 trillion opportunity that is sitting there for brands and retailers to take if they can talk, if they can speak the same language as these conscious consumers. So we wanted to bridge that gap. We wanted to connect these brands, help them connect with these conscious consumers and for conscious consumers to connect with transparent products. So our verification tool 
that is enabled by, by blockchain, um, that it's um, um, published and, and, and uh, deployed on a real production environment for consumers to use an app to verify the claims, to scan the products and get the traceability, we think that not only drives the sustainability initiative, this transparency initiative, but will help retailers untap this new market. So I kind of that's wanna, for us it's a huge, 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 huge value. I kind of want to kind of chime in on a few things that you just mentioned uh, in the past uh, few minutes. Now, firstly, you guys were from originally from Deloitte. Now, that is something that's very, very interesting uh, to, to start. And usually most folks, uh, I mean, the fact that Deloitte uh, had a blockchain lab and apparently your team, right? And when I look through your team uh, um, profiles, right, on your website, um, majority of you guys were from Deloitte blockchain lab. Now, why was it that, you know, instead of just sticking with Deloitte and seeing how the whole blockchain space is actually growing, uh, why do you all eventually move to a startup and decide to kind of want to do this? I think that's something that's a little bit curious. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very curious to find out. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers are going to be curious to find out as well. I'm grateful for everything that Deloitte gave me. It's, a, it's an incredible company to grow, uh, to develop uh, all the skills that, 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 that now we have. Um, I started there in 2014 after my MBA here in US um, and then took a role as a product lead for the blockchain lab. So Deloitte was really one of the pioneers in the blockchain space um, on building solutions for enterprises back in 2012. Um, and then I, th I, think, I think it was about impact. I think it was, it was about um, the, the products that we're building, the services that we're building, how do we, how do we make an impact? into the end consumer, into the company. And, and for me, it was about building a product and, and not a service, right? With Deloitte, we were building a lot of services. Uh, we were building products as well. But I think, I think to me, the, the motivation um, and the experience on actually building something from scratch and being able to see it through the end, I think that's a huge uh, motivational factor for for every entrepreneur, for everyone that, that's on a space that's growing a lot, that there are a lot of opportunities. And for me, it was that, like taking a different challenge, a, ch a challenge to be able to build something from, from scratch with a real product that can, can, can really make an impact in this world. So maybe, maybe very quickly, uh, what is your startup experience, Jonathan? So my startup experience uh, is messy. I, 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 I I did a couple of uh, a couple of startups while I was uh, doing uh, my my MBA and and a bit after that. So I built a startup with uh, friends in in the university. Um, it was around coupons and the use of beacons, uh, so geolocated uh, rewards and discounts. Uh, it was a great experience, a huge uh, failure uh, for for me, but but a good learning experience. I think that's that's what. Everyone will tell you when they fail on a startup. It was a great experience, but it was. Uh, we ran it for, for two years, and you know, obviously we scored um, a couple of uh, good lessons learned. Uh, one of them is do not run a business uh, if you're not uh, located on the same uh, location where you are deploying the services. So we were actually running a company from Durham, North Carolina, and the services were deployed in Uruguay. So it was, it was kind of difficult. But again, I think, I think in order to succeed, uh, you, you need to go through failure. And I went through it uh, a couple of times. So right now, now that you're the CEO of, um, of Citizens Reserve, I think this is a very large project. I mean, the fact that it's, it's a very holistic service that you guys are trying to provide. And I kind of understand that um, it's, it's going to cover manufacturing distribution, procurement, logistics, accounts payable, transportation, management systems. I think that's, that's kind of, uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting for, for the blockchain space. But Lau kind of helped me understand as an individual, if I was someone who's looking at this, at this project at the moment. Now, why is it obviously important? I mean, it's important that I know where everything is coming from. But I want to ask a very dark question. Now that we know that, let's say, let's say I don't trust a particular brand that they, that they state that, okay, this is definitely from this particular country and it's being handled in a certain way. But who will release this information? 
then and and then from then verify on the blockchain how does that work for you guys that's a great question and we get it <clears throat> um, a lot of times and the the problem lies into um being able to address the garbage in garbage out like when you say that we move from these systems based on trust to systems based on transparency after what satoshi gave us Mm. Um, you think that you will still need to trust someone because in the supply chain, you have probably like 10 different steps, 10 different participants, and you're trusting all of them by the information that you're putting um, on the system. The problem is I can lie to you. I can tell you that your t-shirt is blue, right? And, and you'll say, no, I mean, you're, you're lying to me. And, and maybe it goes through. Maybe I can convince you that your T-shirt is blue. But if, I've, if I have 10 other people saying, no, it's white, it's white, it's white, it's white, then you have a good verification tool for that. And that's what we're doing. That's, that's the manual uh, process that we follow. Whenever you have a, a producer saying, I send you these materials to the, this, the distributor, um, you will verify and the distributor you'll ask, hey, did you receive those materials? Did you receive the quantity that he's saying you received? Um, and then you have different verification mechanisms, like when you say this was uh, a vaccinated, 100% uh, we know hormones, right? So how do, we, how do we trust that person that is telling us that? So you then go to the vaccine provider and say, hey, did you do it? Did you sell those vaccines? Yes or no? So you have all these checkpoints through the process and that's how you how do you um, you you make them accountable for what they're saying. Everything that they claim, every attribute they say they have, we go and verify it. Either with these verification parties, they will say yes or no, or with technology. And that's the other important factor. We partner with one of the largest IoT and RFID providers in the world, and the idea is to link the uh, physical assets with the digital representation of it. So if you say this asset came from this country on this day, if the asset has an RFID tag, um, if, if an asset has another type of device, you can actually check, double check if that actually occurred, right? So you have the verification from multiple parties and then you have the verification from the technology itself through IoT that will give you a great input to uh, make sure that, that you're solving the garbage in, garbage out. The problem is not going to be fully solved, but we're getting into a system that it's much better than current systems today. So now how prevalent or how useful um, is this system going to be? Okay, because I think a large part of a lot of blockchain related um, solutions are yet to be tested, especially in the real world. So is it possible to have a, a, a kind of a reference say for example in america at the moment is is it possible to kind of uh, put an apple to apple comparison with an existing system that is not built on the blockchain and you compare that against your um, solution that is going to be built on the blockchain i mean can you kind of weigh in a little bit on that uh, from a technological standpoint i mean not to make it too complex but kind of help us to understand yeah. the, the need for it right right now yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, so we have two, two types of offerings. The first one is when we build end-to-end um, -end solutions with using blockchain for traceability. That's the case of our, um, the partnership that we made in Latin America with one of the two biggest retailers, a $14 billion revenue company that we are deploying now in 10 days um, in the supermarkets in Latin America, right? So people will be able to scan with smartphones and we'll be able to get the traceability of the products. That was an end-to-end -end solution. So we actually went through the entire process of meeting the participants, building a B2B platform for them to enter the data, uh, connecting to the other systems, and then being able to uh, provide that through the end consumer with an app. But then you have the other solution, which is we don't wanna change every single process for every single industry. If there's a company that has current centralized traceability solutions, then we offer a blockchain as a service to basically decentralize that information and make it um, um, more transparent, right? So you would say, I have a company that's actually managing the traceability uh, for furniture, um, and it's great. Like they can actually source the materials, they can actually see the provenance of it, 
but when um, if there's an issue, right? If there's an issue with the, the, the other product, then they could always go and manipulate the data and change the provenance and change anything through the process to benefit themselves. That's what we are offering them. We are offering a service using blockchain where they can decentralize every event, every um, input from every participant. And in that way, through educating their clients, the clients will see that they can, uh, they can, they can see the truth. It's not that they can trust more, but they can see the truth because they have a system that basically protects them in terms of data, in terms of provenance. So we are, we are offering that as well. For current centralized solutions, we are offering blockchain as a service, and it's really easy to integrate to decentralize current, uh, those, those current solutions. So currently you mentioned that it's going to be available in Latin America. Um, is there any reason why it cannot be um, implemented or at least this, this technology at the moment be implemented, say, in, um, you know, in, in any, any of the first world countries at the moment? Are there certain restrictions uh, or, 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 certain, uh, or red tape that you are facing as a company at the moment that's preventing you from, you know, because you guys are from the US, right, at the end of the day. Um, so I'm just wondering why not the US first? Yeah, we, we think that Latin America was a big opportunity for us and a great fit, uh, given uh, the entire continent is facing issues around the end of the supply chain. You have uh, networks of thousands of farmers that are in need for value, that are in need for the transparency to translate that into more value for them, into more sales for them. Um, you have the other component around uh, cryptocurrency where um, you need to go through a lot of education. It's a market that hasn't been explored yet. So for us, it was a good opportunity to drive a solution that we can actually reward them with tokens and they can see the potential of cryptocurrency and blockchain through the use of those tokens. So um, for us, it's untapping a new market that not a lot of people are looking into and use that as the model to replicate it in other regions. So we are already going through processes to replicate the same model that we did in Latin America, here in US, Asia, uh, in Europe. So it was, where do we start? What does it make sense for start? And then where do we provide more value uh, for, for the solution that we have? Now, supply chain management um, systems, right? Or SCAS, they are, I mean, I hope that's how, it, how it's pronounced, SCAS, right? Is there, are there already existing um, service providers that do not use the blockchain that are already dominating the, uh, the industry, right? Are they going to be the first competitors or challenges that you guys will face? Yeah, we don't see competitors in the space. And that, that's tricky because the supply chain space is so big that there's everyone um, really tackling one specific problem. And it's, I mean, it really uh, takes a lot of time to solve those different problems in the industry. So everyone is trying to implement their solution. The program right now is around integration. If you want to buy something and ship it from here uh, to China, then you need to go through a lot of processes, different systems and different documents. What we are trying to do is trying to integrate all these services uh, in one single communication channel. So the ecosystem that we created, we built a core layer that it's free to use, that is open source, and then we have the right links, the right APIs to connect with existing service providers that can serve our clients. So we started with marketplace for our clients, um, a decentralized marketplace with no intermediaries where they can buy and sell raw materials and assets, and then the trace solution. And then, for example, we will want them or someone to offer them financing for the network of farmers that we have in Latin America or other regions, uh, offering insurance, offering logistics. And that's how we connect with existing centralized solutions or decentralized solutions that they want to offer uh, real-time uh, services to this customer. So really our, how we define competitors, we define them more as opportunities. So currently now, your, what do you think will be your largest hurdles or, or most challenging aspects, especially in, the, in, in, in building your, your service in this space? What do you think is going to be the largest um, you know, challenge? I think it's education. <clears throat> I think it's education, uh, being able to show the value to the end consumers, on the enterprise side, 
Um, we've been working a lot um, in the past three years to educate our enterprise, uh, our enter enterprise customers. And then on the other side, on the consumer side, uh, we have been doing that, but it's going to take more time. It's going to take more time to get used to the benefits uh, of these systems and being able to, to get the value and we're getting there. So I think that's, that's one good challenge. The other one is how do we scale? Um, and we, fortunately, we created a good solution to scale around the number of processes, around the number of use cases, and around the number of brands and retailers that we onboard into a system. And we can go through that in another, uh, in another session, but I think it's, um, it's the other challenge that other players are facing. And fortunately, we, we, we were able to, um, to, to solve it in, in a nice way. All right. So anyway, I, I think based on the, the fact that after all that you have just discussed, right, this seems to be a very promising market to uh, continue to build. But is tokens actually you know, relevant for this particular project? Or at least how do you, have, how do you actually uh, put the tokens into this whole ecosystem? Or why does it even have to exist? Yeah, so the token is the enabler, and I'm going to be sure as I, as I need to run to another meeting, but the tokens are really the enabler of the network. We see the token as the enabler of the B2B ecosystem through transaction fees and incentive for node operators, which are the brands and retailers, through governance to govern the technology implementations and business policies around um, uh, supply chain. And then we see them as a good enabler for the end consumer, where we incentivize the users to come on board, um, we potentially will be able to use it for purchasing products in the same retailer and we use it for advertisement to get the supply chain participants closer to the end consumer and get feedback continuously from those consumers to improve the product. So really, um, the, uh, the token is for us is the enabler of everything that we do and everything is aligned to, um, to the token uh, as, as, a, as a tool for decentralization. Jonathan, thank you so much for this, for taking this interview. I understand that you're rushing off to another meeting. And uh, guys, take note that this interview was meant for educational purposes and is not meant to be for finan as financial advice. But glad you guys were able to attend this uh, interview with us and watch this interview. So if you are interested to find out more about uh, Suku or Citizens Reserve, feel free to look at the link in the description below and you can check the project out for yourselves. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for attending Thank this you, Ryan. event. See you in the next, next, see you next time. And all Thank the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.